Today we've got an incredibly heavy malicious compliance story. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, you want me to be responsible for everyone else's job? Okay. Years ago, I worked for an independent dog boarding facility as a customer service representative. Because I was the low man on the totem pole, I often got the evening shift. The managers all left an hour or two early, leaving me and two to three other employees to close depending on how many dogs we had. Sometimes as few as a couple dozen, but often well over a hundred in the busy times. My primary responsibility was closing down the office work, closing the register, making sure all paperwork was in order, etc. Once that was done, I had to pick up with finishing bigger tasks like taking out the trash and laundry, but the actual animal care was supposed to be other employees' job. If they needed help with things like cleaning cages or dishes or non-animal handling things, I was happy to do so, they just needed to tell me. They knew what needed to be done, and if they didn't tell me, I did the other tasks and had no reason to think they hadn't finished their tasks. Also, keep in mind that the managers were always on our rears to finish up and clock out by 9.15, barely doable with the staff they gave us when we had 30 dogs. When we had 100 plus dogs, we often much later. Something we were as unhappy about as the managers were. One very busy night, this one guy, we'll call him Michael, I don't even remember at this point, was in charge of the small dog room. Because it's indoors rather than a big building with runs, it could only hold about 15 dogs and thus took a lot less time than the big main building. The person on the small dog room was expected to finish that room and then go out and finish with the rest of the dogs. By the time I was done with my office work, Michael was up at the big building with our coworker, and I asked whether there was anything they needed help with or whether I could focus on the trash and laundry and making sure doors were locked. Michael said everything was done in the dog room and there were no problems, so I moved on with my job, and about 15 minutes later, it was already 9.45, we were done and left. The next morning, I get called into the small dog room, and my manager angrily gestures at the sink. There are four or five dog bowls sitting there that hadn't been cleaned and put away. She asked me why they weren't done. I pointed out that the small dog room was Michael's responsibility and he had told me he had done everything. She said it was the responsibility of everyone's responsibility to make sure every task was done before we left, no matter who had been officially in charge of the task. I didn't point out that I highly doubted that she'd hold the other employees accountable if I messed up doing my tasks. I apologized but figured in my head that I was getting a verbal warning because it was only 4-5 to five bowls that had been forgotten and was easily fixed and would be something I would make note of for the future. Instead, all of us got an official mark on our records. Cue malicious compliance. From there on out, I took my sweet time checking and double checking that every job was done and done so that there would never be the smallest question that it hadn't been done well enough, no matter how small. I also made sure that my coworkers went behind me and did the same thing. A small piece of debris missed while sweeping the floor? Gotta do it again. Better wash those bowls again. The bed in this empty cage looks slightly askew. Better fix that. I'd check to make sure every door was closed and locked and then do it again two or more times. Now, because the managers couldn't be bothered to make the people responsible for doing their job actually responsible for their own job, we all had to spend the time checking behind everyone else. Which meant that we added another 15 to 20 minutes of time on top of actually doing the job, make me responsible for doing someone else's job instead of expecting them to actually do their job? It's going to cost you an hour of overtime combined. Is anybody else actually surprised that this was allowed to go on for so long? Like once it starts happening where everybody's getting a little bit of overtime here, a little bit of overtime there, you think they would begin looking into it a little bit more and try to cut that down, or maybe because it's so spread out that's why they're not catching on to it. I don't know. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our next story is 1990s tech speak. Low grade malicious compliance here, resulting in the shame of one arrogant supervisor, but little more. Some problems do indeed fix themselves, and this is more for those techies of the late 1990s who had built their own computers and had to mess with IRQs, jumper settings, and the rest of the mess. 
Military settings, so expect a diet alphabet soup as I did try to keep it to a minimum. I'm just a third class petty officer, mostly handling software at the time. Server and computer builds were supposedly beyond me. My supervisor, a second class, PO2, was of the same job, but he was allowed to work on desktops, PCs. We also had a data systems tech first class, one rank above that, so PO1, who was supposed to handle the hardware aspect of fixing computers down to the circuit layer if need be. But he was also the leading petty officer, LPO, i.e. the guy in charge. Though his style was more hands off just to see what we could do, with a focus on cross training people for all jobs. Thus, I was on deck for at least doing the initial triage. We had an officer who wanted his computer fixed, but the PO2 kept jumping into the conversation, talking over me, and correcting me with bad information, which I would counter with references from the book and standard operating procedures. Then they asked, since I know so much, then I already know what the problem is so please explain it. This is the malicious compliance. I was a little irritated. I didn't know what was wrong with the computer, but I knew of a problem. So something something about the interrupts, IRQs, that were connected to the computer's two microphones being fired prematurely before the speaker queue was finished, thereby aborting the speaker queue. We'll have to find a way to stop those interrupts before we can get it fixed. The officer just nodded along, said, sounds good, and walked off. The PO2 looked pleased and started writing it down for the work order, stopped, looked at me and asked, did you just say stop interrupting you? My smile told it all, and he was a little annoyed. Our DS1 just completely lost it and had to leave the room as he was laughing so hard. We, I really, got the computer fixed with no problem. Our LPO later told the PO2 that maybe he should check his interrupts more often. OP went out of their way to use professional lingo that only this other guy would pick up on just to tell them to stop interrupting. That's great, I love that. Our next story is Monitor Everything. Trying to keep the jargon to a minimum and explain acronyms, so sorry if it comes off as patronizing. The company in question are early on in their IT security maturity. They're taking steps and making progress, but it's still early days. To help speed this along, they got someone who claims to be a security expert and known from here as Boss. Boss has an entry-level security qualification, but talks about if it's a doctorate awarded by Hogwarts school for hacking and wizardry or something. Boss has suggested that I get a bit more experience and then maybe go for it. It's an arduous course. My lowest level qualification is generally accepted in the community to be attempted roughly after about five years experience beyond this aforementioned arduous qualification. I'm a red team guy, which means my job is to simulate attacks in order to test the company's security. It's where I have experience and qualifications and what I know. Blue team, the defenders, is not my strong suit, but I have a relatively good knowledge of their role for someone who doesn't do it because I need to know how to not alert them when I'm doing my job. For this scenario though, I was tasked with helping set up the security operations center, SOC, and provide alerting. We get the system set up and ready, and it comes time to set up alerts. In a meeting with boss, I asked for a honeypot account to be created so that we could monitor it for kerber roasting, a kind of attack which abuses a legitimate service to move laterally around the network. Conversation roughly as follows. Boss says, you don't need that, just monitor for kerber roasting. I said that's how we would do it. Create an account with an unused SPN and monitor for a kerber roast ticket being requested for that. Boss says, don't need it, monitor all accounts. I said, but there would be, boss, cutting me off, all accounts. We need to monitor everything. I said, you're the boss. Part of the original request was to set up alerting to email a huge group of people when an alert was created. I decided to ignore that part of the request for testing and just email the boss. I set up an email alert for every Kerberos event and turned it on for two minutes. Shortly after, I had this interaction. Boss says, I've just had a load of email alerts come in. I said, about 1,500? They said, I guess my inbox is flooded. I said, well, it's alerting with a shrugging emoji. The alerts are now only generated for Kerberos events on a honeypot account. I guess this wasn't covered in his course. 
I just feel bad for anybody that works in a situation where they have to work under a boss who acts and thinks they know better than the employees under them, but is actually, as far as qualifications go, probably much less qualified to actually understand all of the work. Our next story is the instinctual malicious compliance brain. If you don't want me to help you, and you want me to break policy, and you try to manipulate me, I'm gonna pull an Uno reverse on you because I happen to have the brain of a bionic raccoon. I once worked at a blue store where we had a very complicated rewards program that near the end of my employment changed the whole system in a very similar but subtly different in a different way and a new marketing strategy that the customers were not appreciative of. Now a little fun fact first, I have ASD, so my brain can have the naive logic of a little computer sometimes. And I don't mean to be mean to people until they start hassling me. It's mostly when I tell them that according to policy, rigidity of thought and black and white rules, check, I could not perform the action that they were requesting. So they would inevitably, over the course of the conversation, debate, have a light bulb moment and think they've just realized a clever little way around the policy. For example, retroactively applying rewards points can't be done. Sorry. So they go, oh well, let me return it then. And I can tell by the look on their face that they think they're being sneaky and boy are they about to one up this dumb cashier. I know full well what they intend to do and that turns my well-meaning but strict naivety into malicious compliance because that's not a nice thing to do. And I'm nice to nice people but if they're not nice, I'm aware of a subsection of the policy that denies them this as an actual loophole. And I of course have all the day's sale prices more or less memorized because I'm getting no more mental stimulation than that at this job, and I know that when they rebuy it, it'll take days for the rewards to return to their account. And I could tell them that today's sale price is higher than what they bought it for, and due to a quirk in the system, oh boy, when they ask me to re-ring it up, it'll ring up as today's higher price automatically. And no sir, I do not have the ability or function in the point of sale system to backdate it to the sale price without flagging the transaction in the system and getting me in trouble. I could tell him that, but he hasn't said anything about repurchasing it yet, unaware that I've pattern matched this exact conversation a million times, and he thinks he's going to pull an Uno reverse on me because I'm obviously thick as a brick wall. So I stay silent the way he is, and when he grins and says, Okay, I'd like to repurchase these now. Don't forget my rewards points. I smile and go, yes sir, no problem sir, and I re-ring him. Sometimes they notice the total has gone up and they begin the frustrated toddler yelling immediately. And sometimes they're so drunk in their perceived victory over this dumb little soft-voiced girl that they swipe their card, go through our complicated rewards and credit card lookup process, Because, of course, they don't have the card with them, which is frustrating because it adds 10 minutes to a transaction, and get their receipt and leave high on their fantastic win. And they don't come back and start yelling and waving arms until they've gotten home and checked their receipt. Hmm. Oh god. I'm a terror. No wonder my coworkers either loved me or hated me. I mean, the bottom line here is you're not going out there and putting your job on the line to try to save somebody else money on what they think is a loophole. Just because they think they're lawyering the system doesn't mean that you have to actually play along. Our next story is for stress code. I work as a manager in a warehouse, non-climate controlled warehouse in the Midwest. Bosses decided supervisors, we now must wear collared shirts, polo or button down. So I got a bunch of bright, obnoxious Hawaiian shirts. Hey, they're collared. You just said collared. I got mushroom ones, comic strip ones, Lilo and Stitch, Pride. He is so confused right now. How much do you guys want to bet that very quickly there's going to be an all new dress code drafted up? This next story is, okay, you can load a hundred pounds of flooring. Stopped at one of the big home improvement stores, the blue one, on my way home from work. We're redoing our floors and I've calculated we need about 18 boxes of flooring. I get a card and go to the flooring section and realize, because I've got my tiny Honda, that fitting all 18 boxes would be ridiculous. So I grab a few boxes, figuring I'll learn how to install them tonight, 
return the next morning in my wife's SUV and do the rest tomorrow on my day off. However, I don't want someone else to take all that style of floor before I come back. So I purchase all of the flooring I'll need at the flooring desk. So I come back the next morning and grab a flatbed cart, more than happy to load up the rest of the flooring myself, a dozen boxes of 20 to 30 pounds each. When I ask the woman at the flooring desk, however, she insists I need to go to a customer service instead. Okay, so I go there, show them my receipt, and they call the flooring desk. A few minutes later, who do I see approaching? The flooring cashier, of course, who had to load all several hundred pounds of flooring onto a different flatbed cart and wheel it to the front. For what it's worth, I utterly failed at installing the floor myself and had to call a contractor. At least OP was upfront and honest about their attempts at flooring this place themselves. I don't think it's necessarily like a karmatic thing for allowing this lady to load up that cart, because honestly it just seems like it's their job, but probably just a humbling experience about what you maybe can or can't do sometimes. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.